All right, welcome back to Core 1929, Methods of Inquiry, Health and Well-Being. Today, we're going to move into a new section of the course. We've been talking a lot about the narratives of COVID-19 for the past few weeks. We've been talking about the stories that we tell each other and ourselves about what a pandemic is, who it affects, and how to engage in health behaviors. And all of those stories matter to the way that the pandemic has been managed. But for the next few weeks, we're going to turn to talking about COVID's origins. By that, I mean we're going to talk about the roots of how infectious diseases emerge and how they spread. And we're also going to talk about the roots of society's response to these diseases. And so today, we're going to take a specifically political science lens on thinking about the origins of the response to COVID-19. So we're going to talk specifically about uh, political uh, institutions. And our agenda for today is we're going to ask the question, what are institutions and how do they affect public health? Kind of a vague word. So we're going to try to unpack that. We're then going to talk about what the effect of state capacity is on COVID-19 outcomes. We'll then turn to thinking about how political structures uh, that shape decision making affect the management of the pandemic. We'll then turn to thinking about what kinds of social social structures are associated with better pandemic outcomes. So those are not formal political structures, but norms, cultural um, norms and mores that, that might shape our behaviors in a pandemic. And then we'll think about how global institutions contribute to, uh, to the extent that they do, pandemic governance and why collective action in global institutions can sometimes be so difficult. And to get us going, I want to present this chart so that you can think about a comparison between national outcomes on COVID-19. So these three lines show the total confirmed deaths per million people in three countries, the United States, Canada, and South Korea. So it's standardized effectively across countries, it's the number of deaths per million people. And we're going to look here at change uh, over time. So it's cumulative, so you can see these numbers uh, accumulating uh, over time. But you'll notice first uh, South Korea. It's towards the bottom uh, here, right, right at the bottom of our graph. Only about seven deaths per one million people in South Korea. And that's in part because the country had an early and aggressive response to COVID-19, began developing COVID-19 tests and scaling up production to thousands per day while its own uh, death toll was still below 100, and then helped export tests and medical supplies abroad in the early days of the pandemic. Its continued testing, contact tracing, isolation uh, of confirmed cases is a model that other governments ultimately uh, sought to use. Additionally, it did all of this without grinding its economy uh, to a halt by providing cash stimulus uh, to most citizens who might have been out of work because of the pandemic. Now, if you look at Canada here, right, sort of in the middle uh, of our uh, three country comparison, about 245 deaths uh, cumulative uh, per million. And its response is sort of between um, the two, between South Korea and um, the United States. Uh, and there are things that are really pretty comparable between the US and Canada, um, public messaging about coordination around the virus, uh, between health agencies and national and local governments, monetary support of international efforts uh, to compare, uh, to cooperate on, on pandemic responses. But Canada is faring uh, much better. And a large component of that has to do with the fact that in Canada, the virus uh, has not been as politicized uh, as it is in the United States. Um, you don't see as much sort of political conflict over key decisions, say about masking, uh, social distancing, um, and the like. Uh, some suggest that it might have something to do with Canada's experience with SARS uh, 20 years ago, which might have left it a little bit better prepared uh, than other countries. Uh, but, but there's something different between uh, Canada and the United States as well. Uh, in this three country comparison, the US is by far uh, the worst. Uh, right now we have 615 deaths cumulative per million people. And this is not because we didn't sort of know about the possibility of a pandemic, uh, epidemiologists and health experts have been calling for the development of, of plans around the pandemic uh, for years. 
Um, and when news of COVID-19 in other countries uh, reached U.S. soil, sort of top uh, officials uh, very quickly uh, knew that it would be able to risk the lives uh, of millions of people. But uh, information on the pandemic as a sort of uh, threat was played down to some extent. Um, additionally, there were coordination failures. Uh, the CDC shipped its own version of COVID-19 tests to state public health labs, only to find out that it didn't work. Um, the FDA took until the end of February to approve independent tests, and state adopted, states adopted precautions at very different rates and implemented them in very different ways. Throughout the crisis, uh, PPE hospital capacity uh, were very limited and, and varied uh, throughout uh, the country. So there's a push to reopen the economy um, in uh, late spring, uh, which resulted in the resurgence of the virus uh, in early summer and ultimately now uh, we are in the fall and it has continued to surge. Now the differences between these countries are not merely the result of biological factors or features of the virus. They tell us something about how countries do at managing public health. So when you think about a virus like COVID-19, I want you to think about it like a stress test. Uh, during a stress test, your doctor aims to find out your heart rate, your blood pressure, your breathing, and how tired you feel under different levels of physical activity, right? So we're not just looking at the effect of the uh, uh, treadmill, for example, we're looking at how you do under different kinds of conditions. And so uh, pandemics are like a stress test for societies. How well, when there's really an emergency, do we do at protecting people from leading lives that are, as Thomas Hobbes uh, said in Leviathan, nasty, brutish, and short. Now, obviously, there's a great deal of variation on this around the world. Some of it has to do with basics of public health, but a lot of it, we're going to suggest today, has to do with the kinds of institutions that govern different kinds of countries. Um, so what do we mean when I say institution? What am I talking about? Um, when we talk about institutions, what we mean are formal rules, including constitutions, but can also be policies, laws, uh, or judicial rulings, uh, and so on, as well as informal norms and customs, uh, such as a norm of reciprocity, that you help your neighbor, for example, or that you vote, uh, that it's a good thing to do that, for example. Um, and these formal and informal rules shape the way uh, society operates. So the example I put here on, on the right is probably something that most people might be familiar with from like an introduction to civics class. You see the sort of separation of power uh, between branches of government in the United States. We have Congress, which makes laws and allocates funds. The president, which uh, appoints justices, uh, makes uh, executive actions, can veto legislation and so on. It's a pretty simplified view of American government. But that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about institutions. We're talking about the rules of the game. And the rules of the game can really affect the way that we make decisions. Um, and it can do so in, in a couple of ways. The first is that institutions can affect the cost of collective action. Uh, you can think about it as the C term uh, in our little R equals B times P minus C plus D equation. Um, and it can do so by making it more or less costly to make decisions. So you might be familiar with the Schoolhouse Rock video, like, you know, I'm just a bill sitting here on Capitol Hill. Um, that is one example of the way that the separation of powers, uh, the, the sad little bill's life as he tries to become a law, um, that the difficulty of that happening is one reason why uh, systems with separated powers can make it a lot more difficult to make a decision, even a decision about something as important as public health. Um, we can also affect the cost of collective action with particular kinds of rules. The rules uh, that we put in place to uh, uh, put people through uh, the paces in terms of uh, uh, registering to vote, uh, that can raise the cost of taking collective action in the form of voting. Um, we can also have rules that create a sense of duty to act collectively. Um, so that's the D term, 
um, in our uh, equation. And you can think about that as when we have a norm, strong norm of reciprocity, an idea that you uh, help your neighbor that's deeply embedded in our culture, um, it might be easier for people to take a collective action. That's another way an informal institution might affect uh, the way that we uh, act collectively. And additionally, um, we're not just talking about everyday people here, um, the way that institutions work can affect the incentives of public officials to respond to public health problems, right? The sense of duty that they have uh, to respond to public health problems. Um, and uh, to think about this, I want you to remember back to uh, the second lecture when we compared Milwaukee and Pittsburgh uh, and their responses to the 1918 pandemic. You might recall that Pittsburgh had a much poorer response to the pandemic. Uh, the number of deaths were far, far higher uh, than in Milwaukee, which is one of the best cities in the country uh, in controlling that, that pandemic. And one of the reasons why, certainly not the only reason, but an important reason, was that in, the, in Pittsburgh, we had machine politics, right? A uh, political party that had a monopoly on power in the city, and there really weren't competitive elections. As a result, that party didn't have a lot of incentive to be responsive to public demands uh, for health uh, protection. By contrast, in Milwaukee, we had a really anti-machine style of politics. Competitive elections produced over time uh, a demand for, and ultimately receipt of, institutions uh, that provided uh, public health, like public hospitals, uh, sewers, and other sort of um, uh, sanitation uh, infrastructure. As a result, Milwaukee was in a much better place to be able to control the virus by the time that it happened. So even though we're looking at two cities in the same country, they had two very different institutions uh, that shaped uh, their outcomes. In Pittsburgh, we had a really anti-democratic um, uh, monopoly over power. And in Milwaukee, we had a system where it was a lot easier for average people to influence uh, the decisions that government made. And this actually reflects a sort of broader finding in the literature on institutions and public health, which suggests that there is, in fact, a durable relationship between uh, some kinds of political institutions and uh, public health outcomes. Uh, for example, there have been some international studies that show that when you control for the year of data collection and a variety of other factors, democracies that are undergoing their first year of rule, so when a country transitions from being an autocracy or something less than a democracy with no competitive elections, to a system in which you have competitive elections, there are uh, there is a gain of two additional years in life expectancy compared to non-democratic regimes. And as democracy persists over time, you see here, the advantage uh, in life expectancy for democracies increases. Uh, by the time that you have more than 25 years of uh, democratic rule, there's free and fair elections, you gain uh, significantly in terms of life expectancy, I think about 14 years here. And that's again, when you're controlling for a variety of other factors about the country, included, including its uh, relative level of economic affluence um, and so on. So becoming a democracy includes a lot of benefits for public health. And actually that's true as well when you look at the reduction in infant mortality. So when you, again, control for the year of data collection and a variety of other factors, after a decade of being uh, a democracy with competitive elections, infant mortality drops by 30% compared to non-democracies. That is a huge gain uh, in a key public health indicator uh, for epidemiologists across the world, the reduction of infant mortality. Um, that is gained not by any particular public health intervention necessarily, but simply by transitioning to having free and fair elections. So what's going on there? It's not as if going to the polling place itself is the thing that is causing these changes um, in uh, mortality and, and life expectancy, but something uh, that results from those votes uh, might be doing the work here. Um, so while there are some that have argued that authoritarian societies have been much better at, for example, imposing lockdowns when there's a pandemic, uh, 
Others, including uh, political scientist Arkan Fung of Harvard Kennedy School of Government, who you read for this week, uh, suggest that democracies are in fact an important instrument for uh, protecting public health. And again, there is a lot of literature, uh, not just in pandemics, but on general measures of life expectancy and mortality that would suggest that there is a relationship between having elections and uh, having a uh, better public health outcomes. So why is this? Why is it the case that democracies uh, create some benefit for public health? And there are three possible answers that Fung suggests. And you might already be thinking about these sort of in your own experience. The first is political accountability. When you have free and fair elections, it's not that they can guarantee good public health policy. Clearly, in some cases, they don't. But when they give citizens a chance to punish uh, elected officials who don't effectively manage public health problems at the ballot box, uh, it gives them uh, an ability to have some leverage and public officials might have a little bit more incentive to be responsive uh, on these sorts of uh, problems. So if you think about it, if you have a system where there's no possibility uh, for the public to inform uh, decisions that are being made, say about uh, a bacteria that's in the water, um, it's entirely possible for people in charge to just continue on with the policy that's leading that bacteria to be in the water or to do nothing to uh, remediate it, simply because they're not really worried about losing their jobs if they don't do anything. So political accountability, which elections really, really uh, provide, is crucial uh, to explain that link between institutions and public health. But that's not all, uh, because in democracies, it's not necessarily just that people can vote, it's that in democracies, we have something called civil society. In other words, we have institutions like media, like universities, like um, community organizations or churches uh, that spread the news about what is going on in that particular country or state or city. Um, and when you have institutions that are shining a light on what government is doing on a fairly regular basis, um, it can draw attention to problems that it might be very inconvenient for government to pay attention to. Right? There might be an outbreak of a virus that for a variety of reasons, government might want to ignore, just like the mayor in Pittsburgh uh, in 1918 might have wanted to ignore. Um, but when you have a robust civil society, newspapers, universities, other organizations, it's easier to shine a light on some of those uh, problems when they occur, which can again affect the incentives that elected officials have to be responsive to demands on public health. The third thing that matters for fun is localism. And I'll emphasize that not all democracies are localistic uh, or contain a lot of local power, but there is something about democracy which spreads power to multiple sites. So in uh, the Constitution, uh, there are several main articles of the Constitution which give power to multiple uh, sites of power, right? Not one institution uh, in the Constitution is sovereign, right? And as a result, uh, it makes it easier for those institutions to sort of hold one another uh, accountable. Uh, so in many states, uh, there are nonprofit organizations that have played an important role in holding um, the uh, state government accountable on uh, providing key uh, benefits. And some of those uh, nonprofit institutions also support uh, the provision of those benefits uh, themselves. So there's a kind of localism uh, story to why institutions like democracy uh, can help promote uh, public health. So all in all, there's some real plausibility to this argument that uh, democracy, while it's messy, while it can be problematic for certain things, uh, actually has a lot of mechanisms within it that make it easier for people to hold elected officials accountable uh, for uh, taking steps to protect their health. However, like any argument, there's always a question about how far does the argument take us? How much variation in outcomes, say across countries, can Fung's argument explain? 
And there's some interesting evidence on this. Uh, and the evidence is that even among, and actually even within developed democracies, right? so among uh, countries that are developed democracies, and even within that country, across different regions of the country, there's a lot of variation in health outcomes, even when we're more or less holding democracy constant. And so this um, uh, graph here looks at the uh, predicted um, uh, deaths per million. It's a logged measure of it, uh, just a way of standardizing the measure. Uh, and that's on the x-axis. And then it plots uh, that against the actual deaths uh, per million on the y-axis. So if you look at this group of countries up here in this circle, these are countries that do worse than predicted when you are looking just at health uh, conditions, when you're looking at things like aging in the population, sort of pre-existing disease, public health institutions, and the like. So in these countries, they do worse. They have more deaths per million than you might expect if you're just looking at the public health institutions. Countries below the line here do better than predicted. So in other words, there are fewer deaths per million than just looking at the public health correlates would suggest. So this means that Fung is probably right to an extent, but there might be some limits to his argument. Uh, there might be some things that vary even across democracies or within them uh, that might help us explain this variation uh, that we see between countries that do worse than predicted and those that do better than predicted. So what's going on here? And I will leave you with a little bit of a cliffhanger because this is the end of part one. Uh, so what I want you to do is complete the first quiz question and then take a quick break and move on to part two of the lecture. And you will see the answer to this question when we return. So see you momentarily.